from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Beecher Wiggins, Director for Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access, and we want to welcome you to another in the series of Library Services, LC's Digital Future, and you that has been and continues to be coordinated by Angela Kinney and Judith Cannon. And this particular one, they had to expend extra energy because I confused them with my timing and my availability. So I express extra thanks for today's session. Today we want to update you on where we are with BibFrame. We won't have formal introductions. We'll have each of us introduce ourselves as we speak and there will be four of us by the end of the session. I will be the briefest of all. You'll be pleased to hear. Excuse me. Is this being recorded? <laughs> uh, BibFrame has been underway now, the BibFrame pilot and pilot two has been underway now for almost a year. Um, and we've been, the staff who've been involved have been using the BibFrame 2.0 model. We launched this pilot to test um, the library's approach to linked open data using the RDF resource description format structure. We're at a point now where we are assessing the pilot based on the work of the 60 or so staff members who have been participating in this for the past 11 or so months. These staff have been cataloging their materials, the materials that they received on a regular basis, daily, using uh, BibFrame. And in most instances, they are also continuing to um, catalog those materials using the MARC format. So there's been a lot of contribution on the part of the participants who have taken part in this. Before we depart next week for the American Library Association annual conference in New Orleans, we will issue a report of what we've learned during the pilot based on the input, the feedback, and the output of the participants. Staff in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office, NetDev, and in Cohen um, are frantically now putting together the final touches on the report for my review. Based on our report and assessment, we also want to be able to make some definitive statements about LC's commitment to BibFrame. Today, Nate Trail, Joda Williamson, Les Hawkins, and I will give uh, you, our LC colleagues, an update before we do similar briefings and updates for uh, our external colleagues in New Orleans. I'll speak briefly about the goals of the pilot. These goals form the framework of the pilot assessment and the report that will be issued shortly that you'll all be seeing. Nate will address the BibFrame database, the conversion process, and related points. Les and Jody will focus on the BibFrame editor and the changes made to it for the pilot and improvements that were made during the pilot based on the feedback from the participants engaged in it. The goals were set from three perspectives. Mine as the director, Ned Devs as the technical lead in the project, and Coins as the training lead. From my perspective as director, I want us to be able to determine that BibFrame can be applied to a large participant pool, i.e. that BibFrame will be scalable and could be adopted by institutions of any size. If the Library of Congress can do it, anyone should be able to. I want to determine that LC will indeed pursue BibFrame as the data pathway and the ultimate replacement for the MARC format. 
And lastly, I want to be able to announce the decision to the library and the vendor community. Because until the library is able to make a firm commitment, we won't get the buy-in and the system development that will be needed to make BibFrame uh, a viable library community format structure. To reach such a decision point, much work was required um, in the technical arena and the associated training sphere. From the NetDev perspective, what was desired was a realistic cataloging environment that allowed catalogers to create bibliographic resource and authority descriptions in BibFrame, just as they are able to do in the MARC environment. To achieve this, the database conversion was required, a database conversion was required, i.e. MARC to BibFrame. And you'll hear a bit more about that from Nate. There are many steps involved in making this a reality. The pilot assessment that, we ta that I talked about will cover this and show how readily we were able to address the various issues and concerns that were raised. Associated with the converted database was the need for an input tool, the BibFrame editor, that will enable catalogers to handily and easily input data for the BibFrame descriptions that they were creating. Much of the editor improvements reflected the Cohen perspective, um, that is from both the teaching perspective and vantage point as well as the ongoing interaction with the pilot participants and the improvements that were made along the way to the editor. For pilot two, a lot of energy and effort went into enhancing the editor and we hope we'll have a, a better tool as we move forward. And Les and Jody will talk more about that shortly. So now I ask you to stay tuned for the report and assessment that will come out ne by next week. And now we will hear Nate talk about the database and some of the work associated with that. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to see that some of us are not CAPS fans, <laughs> <laughs> or we are more nerdy than we care to admit. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the BibFrame database and uh, conversions between Mark and BibFrame and uh, some other things. So this is an overview of the data flow from Mark to BibFrame. Uh, First of all, we take all of our uh, name, title, and title authority records out of ID, and we do a conversion from MARC authorities to BibFrame, convert those to works. And then we um, convert all the MARC records and try to match against those name, title, authority works and store them in the database as well. Uh, and then um, the BibFrame descriptions circle represents where the editor is that you can natively create a brand new BibFrame description or call something up out of the database, edit it, and save it back. And during all that time, there are links between and among the BibFrame database itself and id.loc.gov. So there's about 1.2 million title and name title authorities that we converted to Bibs, about 17 million Bib records, and that includes some stuff that we don't distribute outside. But um, we wanted to try to create a catalog just like the Voyager catalog system has so that when somebody is doing descriptions, they can call up whatever is available inside the, the catalog. We have daily feeds coming from both ID and the uh, ILS. And since people are doing duplicate entry, we have to be able to block things where the cataloger created it natively in BibFrame and we don't want their record from the ILS to come back through. Um, so we're doing a merging that takes a converted record and uh, matches it to existing BIB records. And we have also have proce processes that allow us to validate between um, when, it, when a BibFrame description is natively created and converted to RDF 
uh, and converted to JSON or converted back to XML, we want to be able to validate that that is still a good structure. So there's a lot of different processes and workflows that we have to uh, maintain and support and places where things can break all the way through. So this is a picture of our uh, cataloging homepage. It's not the, the BibFrame database homepage. It's not particularly meant for outside users, but it can be. Um, we're focusing on allowing the cataloger to do their work, and we're also focusing on being able to count things for um, when Beecher wants to know how many of one thing or how many of another. So we want to be able to support the workflows, <clears throat> but we also want to do statistical analysis on, you know, what did we get right, what did we get wrong, how can we clean up a certain batch of records. There, so there's all kinds of different ways of cutting the data uh, once it's in BibFrame. Okay, so there are uh, keyword searching, there's uh, title searching, name and subject searching. There are facets once you get in by language and LC class. There's all kinds of filtering by work or instance. There's uh, left anchor browsing. Um, let's do some of those. <clears throat> so this is a title search for babes in Toyland. Uh, and you can see that when you look down the left, these refinements are different facets. So for Babes in Toyland, there's a whole bunch of notated music, some movies, some audio, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, for left anchor browsing, we could try an imprint. So these are all the uh, imprints of Harcourt, and you can see that uh, on the title page of many of these things, it's expressed in a bunch of different ways. They're probably all the same publisher, but uh, right now, from the MARC record, this is what we have. So as we go uh, through these processes, we're probably going to go behind the scenes and say, let's see how many of these things we can say are the same publisher or from the same publishing agency and link them together better. But at least this way we have them in a line and you can do quick analysis of these things. So the editor <coughs> is tied tightly to the database, and it allows us to take up any description for editing as long as it's within a particular defined profile. And the reason for profiles is that um, BibFrame is a very large descriptive uh, uh, container set, but uh, say notated music has a pretty defined set of things that you want to use to describe. So the profile allows us to narrow down what we want the cataloger to be able to do and be required to do. <clears throat> so you can call up a record and edit its description, or you can add an instance or an item. Um, you can decide that this particular thing that you're working on is linked to another description in the database, and you can link it to name authority records so that we're not just entering strings anymore, we're actually linking to a defined name authority or subject uh, LCSH authority, et cetera. And then you can store it back in the database and it looks just like all the other descriptions that we already have. But there are a number of issues that we've discovered as we go along. <clears throat> we don't have a profile for every type of description that there is. Um, and when we do a conversion of a record from Mark, there isn't really an exact one-to-one -one match that tells us that this previously Mark record should belong to this BibFrame profile. So when you call up a record, we have to make a decision of which profile we're going to put it into. And when you do that, you make that default decision, there are uh, RDF description elements that are not available to be edited then in that BibFrame profile. So what do we do with that information? So far, we have said we're going to keep it and post it back, but we're not going to allow you to edit it, which is a problem for people who want to be able to actually edit the whole thing. So the editor itself has got some uh, things that we need to work through, uh, but we're discovering these things. <clears throat> F 
uh, there's a difference between an IBC update and a clone, even though it looks like you're doing the same thing. So if you, if you see an initial bibliographic control record in the database and you want to call it up and edit it and save it back, you're basically trying to save the same set of descriptions back, a work instance and item. But if you want to clone something, you want to call up that same record but save it under a different ident identifier. So we've had to find ways to say, um, clone this thing, give it a new identifier, probably the LCCN, and then save it back completely parallel but um, having basically the same metadata except for a new title or something like that. And uh, catalogers keep coming up with new ways of showing us that we haven't gotten it done yet, so we keep doing new profiles. So uh, between the database and the editor then, when you call up a description, we have to do um, a little bit of wrangling because we store the data in XML, but the editor it wants to see JSON. So our RDF has got to be expressible in a variety of ways. So in the database on any given record, you'll see that you can convert it to all those different things. And I talked a little bit about the profiles being um, one of the mechanisms that are causing us problems, even though they let us have um, a lot of advantages as well. Um, there is also a distinction between how something is created natively in BibFrame versus how it was converted from a mark record. So you can, uh, if you are doing a mass conversion, you make decisions about what, it, what happens to the 008, et cetera. But when somebody is natively creating it in BibFrame, you can actually know their intent a lot better. So BibFrame native descriptions are in some ways better, but they need to be equivalent so that they live side by side in the database. So there's about five different ways that you can express a source um, based on whether it was created natively or not. But we have to find ways to make it all look the same so that when you push a button to query it, it's queryable identically. So we, um, when we do the merging, what we're doing is we're um, trying to match basically on the name and the title. Um, if we find a match when something is converted, we'll take the work and instance that's created, we'll take the subjects and the classification data and put it onto the, the work that we found in the database. And we'll uh, discard the work and attach that instance to that work. So um, this has been good in some ways, but it's also been problematic because some of the times when you have a name title that matches, you really wanna do um, an RDA expression work instead of doing a merge and saying this is an instance of that other work in the database. So we're going to have to go back through the database and look for places where the thing should not be a merge onto another instance, on, onto another work, but should actually be a work that has a expression-like relationship to, an, to the work that it was found in the database. So uh, also on um, Bibliographic records are 7xx related titles, and those we need to be able to, um, oh no, I'm sorry, the 7xx names, so uh, somebody who's an illustrator of a work. When we do a merge and we drop the work, the illustrator of something also get, goes away because the original work does not have an illustrator, but this particular edition does. So the merge in that case, saying that this is an instance of that, may be true, but we've lost some key information about that. And the illustrator should not be m merged onto the original work. So we really need to have a work in between that says this is a work in its own right with an illustrator, but it's linked to that original work. And sometimes, of course, there are no title or un untitled things, so we don't want to merge those. So the merge specs, um, it's pretty detailed here. I'll just let you read it. It's not that um, interesting. Here's an uh, uh, instance where something worked quite well. And earlier today, that um, image wasn't working, so I'm glad to see the cover art thing got put back in. So this, this bib ID, 203.786, was merged with this name authority work, Huckleberry Finn. And when you look at that 
Huckleberry Finn, you can see that it's related to a whole bunch of other stuff. So in BibFrame, we say that something is related to something else, and then using the Sparkle query language, we're able to say that uh, a particular work has a relationship to something else, but then you can also say what, what else is related to that other thing, and you can see, you can bring things together in much more interesting ways. Okay, so this is an instance where it worked, but you know, it probably uh, the, oh, that didn't work. Let's go back to it. Sorry. Try again. So concerto selections is probably not an actual work. It's just a co-location mechanism. But it did bring these things all together. Um, I would say that all of these instances probably have, uh, should be works in their own right and be somehow related to this overall collection work. Um, so in a future pass, we'll straighten that out. All right, so uh, when we do this conversion, we, we've noticed that the name titles that were described in ID have lots of extra information like the medium, the form, et cetera, that are disambiguators from previous works. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a work that has some of these extra subheadings, chop off that subheading and say, all right, can I find a name title match with everything except for this little par part? And if I do make that match, I'm gonna make a relationship between those things. And all of these things that I've highlighted in red are candidates for such linking. Um, bibliographic records have the same thing. When they have a 130 with lots of subparts, we should be able to chop off the subparts and say there is some relationship between everything except for that last node. And so we're trying to do that as well. Um, and here's what I was talking about, 7XX related titles. Those things we should be able to say, formulate the name and title and see if you can find a match in the database and make a direct link between those things. So here's one where it actually did work, a vocal score. So this is a Rossini vocal score and the related work does not have vocal score on it. Um, okay, here's a translation, Ultimate Iron Man. So this one is in Greek, and it linked to the name title authority work, which has no language on it. But then it turns out that because we're asking questions of it, there's also a Croatian translation. And I haven't yet done it, but the Croatian translation really should be a sibling of the first one that I started with. So that on that old work, you should be able to say, and what other languages has this been translated into without having to go up to the higher level. So there are, there are lots of things down the right-hand side that, are, that we've just started exploiting the, the nature of RDF um, in uh, creating these links. Okay, 130K selections. So these poems are related to each other and apparently translated into Romanian as well. But here are some of the uh, actual poems and not just... Um, the overall selection work. Okay, and the bibliographic record with 7XX related titles. I've only been doing this on an experimental basis, so the whole database has not been um, completely converted to having all these links, but this uh, poem, I guess, or song, <laughs> is related to a lot of other things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, still to come, I, I started this presentation, uh, I gave it out in California in April, and I had a slide called Still to Come, and it had all these things on it, and I realized when I opened it up that we've already gotten started on most of these things, so I crossed them off here. We, we have exported all the 
uh, RDF works and instances and stored them at ID for people who are interested in it, the big libraries, to be able to download and ingest into their own databases and do something with. Um, we're linking related titles, Mark 7XXs, the name title authority records on a daily basis, those things are linking to each other. We haven't gone back and done the whole thing yet. Um, and we're starting to experiment with linking instead of merging on things that should be RDA expression works. Um, so we're still looking for more ways to link and we're thinking about ingesting different types of data, including SIP and Onyx records, although some of those are already in the database. So getting uh, the data upstream a little bit may not be that that useful, but we'll see. Um, Casolini, the Italian cataloging partner that we have, has a conversion of their own, and they converted all of our database and gave it back to us, and they can give us weekly conversions of BibFrame records if we want it. So we're doing an experiment with how do we look at that data, convert it to whatever it needs to be for us, and ingest it. And that's all I have. Thank you. <coughs> So I'm Jody Williamson. I joined the library a year ago from Oakland, California, where I worked for Innovative Interfaces. I'm very happy for the Capitals. I am way happier for the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> and Les and I are going to talk about using the BibFrame editor. So I'll start out with just a quick overview of selected portions of the editor, starting with um, there's the URI or URL if you want to go explore it yourself. And we've set up a lot of editor profiles that are based on the materials cataloged in the library. As Nate said, we haven't covered everything yet, but we're trying. One of the, um, one of the ones that we added during the pilot uh, is the rare materials profile, and it has some special uh, elements that the rare materials cataloger who's in the pilot requested. This is how a, the editor profile for a monograph work looks. There's just a lot of fields that can be filled in and a lot of them underneath that are tied to controlled vocabulary so there's a lot of type aheads and lookups so that you don't have to remember to type everything in from scratch. This is an example of one of the type of heads. So for form and genre, it's tied to the Library of Congress genre form thesaurus. So you can just start typing, and then you can select the term that you want, highlight it, and it goes into the editor. And behind the scenes, the URI that's associated with that term that's in id.loc.gov is assigned to the field, and then you get a nice true triple on the back end with URIs. And also, we're, I've been experimenting with different ways to put subject headings in, where you can search each component of a complex subject heading separately and get a URI for each component. And they are all stored together in the output. Where possible, we've tried to put a lot of standard values in. So the language lookup is uh, searching the MARC code list for languages. And we've added in other specialized terms that are part of the RDA registry. We've put them into ID just to keep all of the terminology in-house, but I imagine someday we would be directly linking out to the RDA registry for these types of terms and probably more. In each profile, we've also tried to customize standard values where possible. So there's a lot of the formats have a media type of unmediated and a carrier type of volume, but then we also have video and video disc for the DVD profile, audio and audio disc for all of the CD profiles, and projected and film reel for the 35 millimeter profile. And we've also customized what fields are included in each profile. So these are the identifier options for four different profiles based on the, the number, the identifiers that are available for each format. So the monograph profile has the fewest. 
and the uh, music and sound recording profiles have many more. So the advantage of this is that if you're only cataloging monographs, you don't have to sift through a lot of fields that don't apply to your format. But if you are cataloging in a specific format, you have the fields that you need. And one thing that we just started a couple of weeks ago is to put in the uh, Perform Music Ontology's terms for medium of performance. As part of the LD for P uh, linked data project that Stanford was coordinating through a Mellon grant, there was a group of music catalogers that uh, worked on a specialized vocabulary for music. And their terms for medium of performance are much more detailed than what was developed here for medium of performance. So we've been working with how to incorporate their vocabulary and their, um, their prefix in the ontology. And so this is the output where you can see that uh, BF is used as the prefix for the bib frame terms, but PMO for perform music ontology is used for their terms. Their uh, ontology for music in this area is very, very detailed. Um, I think we've kind of gotten it to work, and I'm eager to hear what the music catalogers uh, have for feedback after they've experimented with it a bit more. So when you're using the bib frame editor, there are a lot of different ways that you can catalog the material that you have. So the first one would be that you have a brand new work and a brand new instance. And so you start with creating the work. This is how a lot of the cartographic catalogers are doing their map work. So you can go to the editor workspace, select cartographic, and choose to start with the work profile. And here's an example of all of the work level information being added in. Um, during the pilot, the map catalogers have been really outstanding to work with because they really looked through what the first profile was that we gave them and suggested a lot of things that would make it better for them. And then here's their instance level information. It's a bit more detailed. There's more fields. And finally, there's two local fields. Um, admin metadata is sort of all of the data only a cataloger could love. A lot of it comes from the leader and the 042 and the 040 of the mark record. And it's stored in a separate block. And then there's the item record block, which we have not really done a lot of work with yet. It's, it's fairly generic and not really Voyager specific at all. And I think as we go forward, we're going to have to make some decisions about how to treat the items in bib frame. Because if we want this to truly be a replacement for the Voyager ILS, are we going to have to put in Voyager specific fields or should be be looking towards the next gen ILS and what it needs. And these are all uh, decisions to come. And after you input all of this information, then you can preview it to see how it looks in different RDF serializations. I believe during the first pilot, this was like the last proofreading check before you were done with the record. Now it's just a cute way to see a lot of data in a different way. And then you click on the post button. And back in the editor workspace, you have this highlighted area where it says that the description has been submitted for posting into the database that Nate was just talking about. And you can click on that um, LCCN, and ta-da, there it is in the BibFrame database. This um, we got working earlier this year, and it's been really fun to um, watch the records go in and out. And then there's also sort of this moment of panic when you hit the post button and you're like, please work, please work. <laughs> Another workflow is to add a new instance to an existing work. This happens a lot with DVDs of television shows. So we have the Blu-ray DVD profile, and you select the instance first. And then you can either search in the BibFrame database to find the work that you need, or you can search within the BibFrame editor, but you really only get the name of the work. If you want to be really, really sure, you want to search first in the searching in the database because then you have access to the full uh, suite of data to verify. And then after you link to the existing work, you don't really need to add anything else to the work, so then you put in all of your instance level data. The DVD profile is one of the longest ones that we've created, and we've tried to add as much um, standard drop-down lists as possible so that the cataloger doesn't have to keep typing in the same bits of data over and over. And now Les is going to talk about IBC records because this is one of our big recent accomplishments.
Hello, I'm Les Hawkins. I work in the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division. Um, and this, uh, I am excited about demonstrating this, but it's not one of my accomplishments. It's really our colleagues in NetDev who've done this with the searching and the interfaces for uploading um, IBCs. Um, the other thing about being able to work with IBCs uh, is that catalogers in the, the uh, BibFrame 2.0 pilot told us that this is very important to be able to do um, because uh, IBC work um, is varied. There's a lot of different type of um, records that are coded IBC. There's a lot of different workflows associated with it and it's a huge part of LC's cataloging workflow. So I'm very excited that this, this is still in development from what I understand. I've mentioned a few of the categories of uh, IBC records uh, that catalogers need to work with. Vendor records, ESIP record, ISSN pre-publication records, I say and others, but that leaves out copy cataloging, a huge, huge part of the workflow. Um, Nate mentioned cloning IBC records to like build up an, another edition for an existing uh, record. So there's, there's just a lot of work that's, um, this is a large workflow for LC and it's very, um, I'm very happy that uh, this is being developed. I have an example here um, and I want to say that I began, I just found this in the, in the Voyager database and I applied it to the BibFrame uh, database, but I started out with a search in the BibFrame database. I pulled up the record um, and I'm showing here that you, we have a um, link that we can paste in to the upload uh, into the editor, the BibFrame editor. So what, that's what I've done here. I've copied the link, the instance link here A new feature just last week um, was added by our colleagues in, in NetDev, and that is the ability to choose a profile, choose the appropriate profile. Before, before this feature was added, they just all of these um, IBCs just loaded into the monographic um, profile. Um, and now if you have, um, this is an example of a rare book being loaded into the rare materials um, profile. If you have a serial IBC, a pre-publication um, IBC that you're working with, it can be loaded into the serial profile. The thing about IBCs is they often, they're in the database, they often need additional work later. So that's, that's really what this, I forgot to say that at the beginning, that's really one of the important uh, things that you need to be able to do with IBC records is update them later. And so that, that is possible now within the BibFrame editor. And so this just shows you pasting in that instance uh, URI that you copied from the BibFrame database and submit the URL and um, URI and it brings up the uh, BibFrame instance in this case. This is, uh, this is from the uh, rare materials profile because I noticed that it has collective title there. The other pro profiles don't have that. Um, it also mentions here the uh, RBMS terms um, that are part of that particular profile. So you can make updates to this record and send this um, uh, description back into the BibFrame database. Um, this is just showing some of the changes that you might want to make. I didn't, I didn't make any changes to this, to this description, but maybe you want to update the extent or add an extent or make uh, in the instance profile. So over here on the left, I'm making a change to the instance profile by changing the extent. And over there on the right, I'm looking at the work profile to add uh, illustrative content uh, to the description. And then it's posted back into the BibFrame editor. And that's, that's the basic steps for, for the IBC. Do you want to open up? This uh, for questions now for, for all of the uh, speakers. Who is open for questions, comments? In addition to Cassidy Libre, what other libraries or institutions are using the BibFrame data that we are creating here as libraries projects? Do you know? Can you just tell? I know Cassidy has its own way of creating and collecting data, but. Well, uh, 
they're not actually keeping power and electric for summer. But everyone was very excited to see that you're pushing electric and whatnot. Have we got any feedback on anyone using the post thing? There's one database yet. There's one guy who found some errors in it. So. <laughs> And the, the editor profiles are available for download on GitHub, and I know that Stanford has downloaded them and made some modifications so that the lookups will work because everything on the editor profiles is very tied to the LC ecosystem, which means it doesn't really play outside the network. And I, I, so I'm pretty sure Stanford has tried to modify their pro the profiles to work on their system. Regina? There are a lot of things about the new RDA toolkit that worry me. <laughs> That's just one of them. <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's something we're really going to have to figure out. I'm going to, there's a program at ALA on Monday morning about the toolkit that I'm going to go to to get enlightened. I'm also worried about the um, loss of rule numbers <laughs> since we have a lot of hot linking in the editor that is tied to the URL for the rule. The most helpful thing is that we will have a full year from the time the new RDA toolkit and its content are stable, which will be no sooner based on the RDA board input than December of this year. So we'll have a year. And I've made it clear to our policy specialists that we want to determine how we want to move forward with it. And whatever linkages we can make with the big frame side of the house, we'll want to do. Um, so there'll be a lot of, I won't say a lot, there will be much behind the scenes work to sort this out and to make sure we roll this piece out uh, as appropriately and as seamlessly as we can. But the um, impact is not that, is not as large as you might think because it's more of a expressing that information and us being able to write a query that says, go get me that history uh, and show it to me in a new presentation. Yeah. 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 Just like great. the name title or an imprint browse that I showed, we could do something like that for titles. And removing the unnecessary information in the display so you really <coughs> could configure, I just want the title, the dates, the publisher. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that we're doing is handcrafted, so we could do a presentation like that easily. But when you're talking about a next generation catalog, they're not going to do that necessarily, unless that's the new, you know, the only new way of doing serials or something. 
So that might need to be put into requirements if you need to be able to see that. Because we're not building the library's next catalog. Right. We're building a demonstration that says, here's how you could <coughs> take advantage of our DI. I think I already talked down in one of the next gen meetings about <coughs> that. <laughs> Um, there. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, are there any plans to move the frame from a browser into a standalone application? And along with that, I'm thinking of advantages that, you know, the big one would be maybe not requiring a constant internet connection, um, but also, you know, ability to do key commands and kind of like navigate around more quickly that way. Uh, or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think the, the basic premise of data is that you're, you're connecting to everything all yeah. the time. And so internet connectivity is kind of a built-in. Uh, but as far as like hotkeys for stuff, um, anyone can do that right now. And it, you can do that in your browser to tell, to tell your browser this is what I want to do. It doesn't have to be in a standalone application. Okay. Uh, way in the back was next. <laughs> Then Jessalyn. <laughs> That's a big question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. It's bigger than all of us, frankly. Yeah. But these things are brought up at various meetings, but I, I, I don't think we can answer that question. And I think any, if you're a cataloger in the current environment, um, slowness is kind of built in because we're, we're building ourselves all the pieces that are necessary to make something work. We're not trying to make a fast machine right now. So we're in the stage of can can it be done, not how do we make it seamless. So so your slowness will be solved with a vendor supplied RDF editor etc. system. Um, otherwise, they won't be able to sell it. And some of the swap out that is going on now with the desktop and the plugins will bring some relief. And certainly, our colleagues in OCIO. Of Martin and uh, Judy Conklin are, if not worried, very aware of the issue. Okay, so, Jessalyn, I saw you. <laughs> I can answer the second question. <laughs> um, it would be great to have an OCLC gateway that dropped data right into the BibFrame database, but there's a lot of technological hurdles between that happening now and in the future. The main one is that the all of the BibFrame editor in the database are on um, test servers internally and are not open to the outside. 
And to link up to OCLC, there'd have to be a lot of port traffic opened up. And I don't think we're ready to go there yet. But I, uh, we understand it's very important because downloading records from a, any utility is, is vital for copy cataloging. I think if we move more into a production environment, that would be one of the top things to get resolved. And I'm hoping Les can answer the uh, first one. Well, no, but I, I mean, I think this is, in one way, this is how we're able to do some copy cataloging. We still have to download the records from OCLC. If you work with serials, you have to do your updating and your, your work in OCLC. Then you're bringing that record into, into Voyager if it's held by LC or if it's a, a ISSN record, a pre-publication record. Those ISSN pre-publication records are IBC records. They're coded as such in the Voyager database. So yes, you, you, I, did, I have an example of a pre-publication record that can be loaded with that process that I just showed you. So it could be updated in the BibFrame editor by loading that that IBC record. Uh, other types of copy um, that could be loaded through the uh, uh, load IBC record, I, I believe if they are IBCs in the Voyager database that you've downloaded from OCLC, they can be uploaded and, and worked on in the BibFrame um, database. If they are, if you have coded a, a record IBC in the Voyager database, yes, you can use that mechanism that we just showed you. Actually, you can load in any record that you want. I was gonna, <laughs> I was gonna say, I thought that happened. So when you're, you know, we're talking about serials, and there are lots of post <laughs> post publication serials that we work with. We work with them in OCLC, and we download them into the Voyager database. Uh, but I hadn't experimented with that. But I'm pretty sure with the upload IBC, you can upload any of those records that you've downloaded. Uh, from OCLC and work with them in a bib frame editor. But in other words, if you have a copycat record also that is coded copycat in OCLC, but, it, but you as a cataloger determine that it is not good enough for us to just accept it, we can basically use most of that information, convert it to IBC records, and then use it. Now, I think you go no. in, in the bib frame database, Call it up in this frame as though it was an IBC. Right. Use whatever profile now that you think is appropriate, and it will populate in the editor, change what you need to do, and save it back. Oh. As though it was an IBC. You don't have to change yeah. the, the 906 or whatever code in order to make it work. You just call it up as though it was an IBC. And so all of those records are being, on a daily basis, all of those records that you've downloaded, whether you've not worked on them or not, they're being converted to BibFrame. They're available in the BibFrame database. That's very good to know because we want to get out of the impression as long as they were copied from OCLC, we should not have been fooling with them and doing anything with them. This, this is a new feature. This is why we're excited mm -hmm. about this. Okay, very good. If you can find the record in the BibFrame database, you can recall it in the BibFrame editor. If it's an instance. So back to the OCLC question. Can you, can you get the OCL records through that proxy? Because the metaproxy is sitting on our desk. Yeah, but our metaproxy connects to multiple um, endpoints. It's like you go to the C third guys and see if you convert it. You can't because on the otherwise you have to use their API and then their API you could also somehow figure out something. Got one question in the back. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of the issues with the connecting up to OCLC is on a technology side. 
getting the machines to talk to each other. So. This is a question from uh, Les and uh, Jody. One of the things we talked about uh, in one of our meetings was um, uh, expanding the number of frequencies that are available in the serial editor. And I'm just wondering how that's coming along. I know that the, the current choices that we have are based on um, the frequencies associated As you know, uh, we have a host of other frequencies like uh, four number of a year, five number of a year, and those also involve the fixed field, uh, irregularity fixed field, and so you get two big fields involved here you guys. So I'm just wondering how that's kind of coming along because the serial catalogers, uh, of course, use these other frequencies a lot. Uh, so I'm just wondering how that's coming along. I, I know what I want to do. We just have to figure out if it's going to work. Um, because part of the, the thing is that it's um, two bytes in the 008 field and it's kind of connected to one bib frame property and are we losing anything else that's expressed in that regularity byte to just have it say irregular but it's we'll get there because it's in the RDA registry like that so we should be following that model as well Jessalyn? I'm just curious, um, do you share some of the experiences that you had when you worked with an unmatched twist um, where you had the issues and you resolved it? I'm just curious of any kind of Latin. Um, non Latin. It, since the editor is browser based, it's pretty accepting of Unicode. The challenge has been character set mapping. So if you have a Chinese keyboard or not, um, there have uh, our Hebrew cataloger in the pilot has noticed some um, oddities in searching depending on the diacritic. So there, there's a few things that need to be ironed out, but it's more on a data input end. I think the, the storage and everything getting put back into the database, everything looks fantastic. Yes, since you are the Hebrew cataloger, Roger. <laughs> Very good. Well, it's 11 o'clock right now. Um, how, how do you all wrap this up? Do you we get to go till 11.30 if people still have Oh, questions. it's 11.30. Oh, I'm so sorry. I've been trying to. And this is being filmed, isn't go, it? No, let's just go to the parade. No. <laughs> I think there was uh, at least another question. Sorry. Was there? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.